Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Nandini, and I am one of your Athenaeum fellows for this year. Jennifer Grossman has previously served as Director of Education at the Cato Institute and as a speechwriter for President George H.W. Bush. Today, she comes to the Athenaeum as the CEO of the Atlas Society, an organization that promotes Ayn Rand's philosophy of open objectivism. The principles of objectivism, the philosophy rooted in reality, reason, and individualism has never been more needed nor more neglected, says Grossman. This is the perfect moment to help the public rediscover the moral vision of Ayn Rand. Grossman believes that facts alone are no match for the seductive moral appeal of socialism, which will fail as many times as it is pursued. She will argue that a moral case for fairness premised on the inviolability of individual rights, the virtues of independence, reason, achievement, and the ethics of benevolent self-interest is better than the social justice version of fairness. Grounded in Ayn Rand's vision, Grossman believes these tenets are being leveraged by politicians to increase government power and are more relevant than ever in a culture where envy, resentment, and entitlement are on the rise. Using the Q&A function, we will accept questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send a question, please state your affiliation with the college. Student, faculty, parent, alumni, or friend of the college. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Grossman to the Athenaeum. Thank you so very much. This is uh, so much fun and the world needs a little bit more fun. That is also why I am wearing this dress to bring a little in real life to you guys. This is the dress that I wore last week to the Atlas Society's fourth annual gala in Malibu. And there's a story, an international story behind the dress. So maybe if we run out of questions about philosophy, you guys can tack that on. So. Welcome, of course, to tonight's Athenaeum. As you probably know, that's a Greek word like thespian or narcissist or Dukakis. I actually know that last one because he was my governor and I voted uh, for him. Yeah, even after the, the tank thing. Um, I was young, uh, but fair warning, you can take any political advice I give tonight with more than a grain of salt. Uh, it's great to be here, albeit virtually at the Claremont McKenna College, uh, well known for its scholarship in finance, government, and economics. Uh, also well known for being one of the toughest colleges to um, in California to bribe your kids way into. I went to um, the Claremont McKenna of the East otherwise known as Harvard. And my parents are still paying off the bribe to the admissions officers. Obviously, I'm kidding. <laughs> they paid it off a long time ago. Um, I don't know about you, but I really struggled with my class load uh, at college. There were times I'd call my parents from the payphone. Those were the days before cell phones. And I'd cry to my mom. And uh, I told her I wasn't sure that I, could, I was going to make it. And she'd say, don't give up, honey. You don't want to end up like those loser Harvard dropouts, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg. Thanks, mom. Thanks also to the organizers, organizers, especially Priya. She's just been indefatigable uh, throughout these months. Um, as you may know, my speech was originally scheduled um, to be in person back in February. I had just returned from a 10 day trip to India uh, and then about 20 hours of return travel by way of San Francisco that morning. In retrospect, thinking that I would be fit to speak on campus uh, that evening was probably a little bit overly optimistic. Um, it also may have been for the best because I was, I was pretty sick. Um, it may not have been COVID because I since tested negative for antibodies, but perhaps better safe than sorry as the only thing I want to spread 
uh, at the Athenaeum is an appreciation for Ayn Rand. Actually, you might call me a super spreader of Ayn Rand. Actually, don't, don't call me that, it doesn't sound right. Um, but my trip to India, uh, which is where I was born, did remind me of that the acknowledgement and appreciation of the prescience of Rand's work is growing internationally. The biggest audience for the Atlas Society's content on Facebook after the United States is Venezuela. Not surprising um, given what socialism has done to that once prosperous nation. Uh, and the two fastest growing audiences uh, for the Atlas Society are Brazil and India. Indeed, my favorite experience in India um, after uh, a visit to the, the hospital where I was uh, born was, speaking of birthdays, it was celebrating Ayn Rand's birthday with Indian students your age uh, in New Delhi. They have partnered with the Atlas Society to promote greater awareness of the ideas of Ayn Rand in my birthplace, India. Um, and that might sound a little bit far-fetched if you know uh, anything about India, um, except Ayn Rand has achieved disproportionate popularity there. Um, I learned while doing some research that Indians make more Ayn Rand related Google searches than anyone else uh, other than Americans and Canadians, according to a uh, report in The Economist. That same report showed that um, sales of Ayn Rand's books trounce uh, sales of Marx 16 fold. The uh, sales figures like that, it's no wonder that Marx wanted nothing to do with capitalism. Um, but how could Ayn Rand possibly be so popular in a place like India? After all, India's collectivist political tradition, its spiritual mysticism, uh, its caste system would all seem to be the antithesis of the rationalistic, individualistic philosophy of Ayn Rand. How could Rand possibly resonate with uh, in, in India's patriarchal culture, which gave birth to the now obsolete uh, tradition of sati, the literal embodiment of self-sacrifice, um, in which a, a widow is expected to immolate herself on her husband's funeral pyre. Thankfully, that tradition uh, has died out, mostly due to uh, global warming. Um, yes. Ayn Rand resonates. Women in particular are magnetized to Ayn Rand, the outspoken uh, defender of women's rights. In fact, she emigrated uh, to the United States just a few years after women got the franchise to, uh, to vote. Um, or actually she was, yeah, born after a few years after uh, the, the uh, franchise for women. Um, Ayn Rand was a courageous woman intellectual who celebrated strong female heroines in her novel, heroines who uh, led, led lives of accomplishment and sexual liberation. Um, one of those uh, women was among the group of young Indian students with whom I met. This young woman said, the fountainhead changed my life. It showed me that it was okay to be different and persistent. Everyone nowadays, she said, settles, they settle for mediocre, mediocre lives and families, uh, for following the system, for riding the wave of what everyone else is riding. And so, um, and it is so problematic, especially for a female like myself in a patriarchal society like ours. No one thinks differently wants to do something uh, life-changing. But she said, after reading The Fountainhead, I decided I want to make a change in the world and should take the risks um, associated with following that vision and truth, uh, irrespective of what people say. Maybe, she said, and I'll conclude, I should raise others up by raising myself up. Thank you, Ayn Rand. 
The young lady and other students I spoke with are fighting for reforms, for civil liberties, for criminal justice reform, for limits on the massive wasteful government spending that their generation will pay for one way or another, whether through increased taxes or inflation or national debt. These students were studying law, history, economics, and yet they recognized that in a country uh, where basic literacy, much less literacy of history and economics is significantly limited, um, the spearhead of advancing reform is not to be found in history lessons or economic lessons, but in moral persuasion. They further recognized that no one has ever made a more compelling case for the morality of individualism and capitalism than Ayn Rand. And no one has ever made a more compelling case, agree with it or not, against the immorality of envy, the immorality of resentment, the immorality of greed, which Ayn Rand properly defined as the desire for the unearned. And while in the intervening months since my trip, uh, we have seen the spread of one deadly virus, the coronavirus, um, the virus that has killed more people than any other in the history of the world is a moral virus, what I call an STD, socially transmitted disease. And that, my friends, is envy. And while no one is immune, it's precisely kind of ironically, the conditions that breed prosperity that also form a breeding ground for envy. The massive entrepreneurial revolution uh, that went on in Indi India pre-pandemic and pre-lockdowns with countless new businesses having been started, that brought about a huge explosion of wealth the result, income inequality, which had been, you know, relatively flat over decades, indeed uh, centuries um, of pervasive poverty soared. Why? It's because some people were taking away from other people? No, it was because economic liberalization and capital investment and the tech revolution uh, enabled some people to grow extremely rich by meeting the needs of others. As a result, India last year had one of the uh, highest uh, income inequality level in the world. In, in India, in, uh, inequality measured purely by income is rising, but inequality in terms of life expectation, life expectancy, infant mortality, nourishment, education, and internet access is decreasing. As the students reminded me in India, there is no shortage of politicians there who want to um, use the lopsided measurement of income inequality uh, and turn a blind eye to um, the much more relevant measurement of how vastly the lives of the poorest have improved uh, to justify a return to the days of socialism. Politicians who want to tap into um, that pr primordial ever-present human vice of envy to peddle wealth transfer schemes expropriation and redistribution, all in terms of the greater good. But uh, as the, the historical record is clear, and in fact has never been more clear uh, that such policies have failed time and time again, and only succeed in growing the power 
of the bureaucratic elite at the expense of everyone else. The Indian students and I celebrated Rand's birthday on February 2nd, which also happens to be Groundhog Day, which was particularly fitting because the dramatic failures of collectivism are like Groundhog Day over and over again. The collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, uh, the disasters that are Cuba, Venezuela, North Korea, um, and even essentially China's rejection of um, a communist model in favor of market liberalization. So after all of this, after examples of the failures of socialism have piled up higher and more, more uh, starkly than a mountain of human skulls on the killing fields of Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, socialism has made its biggest comeback right here on American soil. Uh, we saw a field of contenders for the democratic nomination who competed with each other to see who can offer the most free stuff with increasingly hostile and explicit denunciations of capitalism um, and those who've achieved success. Uh, AOC claims that capitalism is quote, irredeemable, end quote. And this system that quote, allows billionaires to exist is immoral. Bernie Sanders uh, recently declared he does not think that quote, billionaires should exist, end quote. Try as I might, I have yet to find any recorded instance of any billionaire anywhere asking anyone for permission to exist. Uh, even Nancy Pelosi, not quite a billionaire with um, a network, net worth of just uh, 120 million, she recently voiced concerns that her party's sharp drift uh, towards outright socialism runs the risk of alienating mainstream voters complaining, quote, you can ask the left, they're unhappy with me for not being socialist, end quote. I guess Nancy thought she could have her $13 pint of ice cream and eat it too. No such luck, Nancy. Maybe she realizes, as Margaret Thatcher once told us, that the trouble with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money or in the case of Nancy, her husband's money. Um, but politicians that are peddling socialism are also keeping a pretty keen eye uh, on the polls. A recent survey revealed that 70% of those uh, between the ages of 23 and 38 would support a socialist candidate for president. The same report revealed that 22% of that cohort believe that, quote, society would be better off if all private property was abolished. And 45% believe that all higher education should be free. Now, those on the left are elated by um, such results. Uh, fantastically citing them as evidence of uh, the consequences of unfettered capitalism run amok. Those on the right, alarmed by such uh, results, blame them primarily on historical amnesia. But uh, addressing historical illiteracy is um, at best part of the answer. The surging appeal of socialism is less a case of misremembered facts and misrepresented history than a case of bad values. Even a 2020 hindsight of history, even a solid grasp of basic economic concepts, neither are a match for the siren song of entitlement, the lionization of victimhood, the stoking of resentment of success and a cynical view of fellow citizens. Conventionally, uh, the, the appeal of socialism has been explained in terms of 
altruism, uh, a self-sacrificing concern for one's fellows, um, and the duty to place others before oneself. Yet new research um, by Pew and Cato digs deeper, confirming what Ayn Rand always uh, knew. Envy and misanthropy are just as, if not more, likely to be driving demands for greater government control than a compassionate desire to help others. Um, groundbreaking new research by Emily Eakins uh, at the Cato Institute reveals that resentment of the successful has a, about twice the effect of compassion in predicting support for increasing top marginal tax rates, um, wealth redistribution, hostility to capitalism, and believing that billionaires should not exist. Um, as for the nostrum that support of socialism is simply uh, a result of idealism, of having an overly rosy uh, view of our fellow men, um, Pew research reveals the opposite is true. 73%, according to this particular survey, of US adults under 30 believe that people just look out for themselves most of the time. A similar share, 71% said that most people, quote, would try to take advantage of you if they got the chance. Uh, and six in 10 say most people can't be trusted. Yet this is the same proportion that uh, would trust governments, bureaucrats, in the name of socialism, to make wise, fair, and benevolent decisions backed up by the power to investigate, regulate, confiscate, and imprison. As Milton Friedman once observed, such thinking takes, quote, a lot of things for granted. Just tell me where in the world we are going to find these angels uh, who are going to organize society for us. The disconnect between um, the distrust of individuals and a near deification of supposedly benevolent bureaucrats um, between the obvious and demonstrated failures of socialism and the enduring appeal of a socialist uh, utopia is evidence not of amnesia or myopia or naivete, but of bad philosophy. Ayn Rand put it best. She said, as a human being, you have no choice about the fact that you need a philosophy. Your only choice is whether you define your philosophy by a conscious, rational, disciplined process of thought and scrupulously logical deliberation, or let your subconscious accumulate uh, a junk heap of unwarranted conclusions, false generalizations, undefined contradictions, undigested slogans, unidentified wishes, doubts, and fears thrown together by chance, but integrated by your subconscious into a kind of mongrel philosophy fused into a single solid weight, self-doubt, uh, like a ball and chain in the place where your mind's wings should have grown. And it's that refusal to recognize, address, and resolve contradictions uh, that is perhaps the greatest indicator that you are operating from a faulty philosophy. And the great benefits uh, of rejecting contradictions in one's personal life, um, in one's relationships, and in one's careers, and in one's political beliefs will be reaped by you. Uh, so as I conclude my remarks and open up for questions, I ask you to check your premises, uh, the basic principles upon which you operate in all realms in life. Do you? 
have a right to live for yourself? Or is your existence justified by living for others? Put another way, who owns you? Do you have a right to compel others to live for you, whether by subsidizing your life choices or controlling other people's life choices or simply funding your vision of social justice. Put another way, who owes you? Reading Ayn Rand helped me and many others decisively answer those questions. Not owned, not owed. It's a liberating way to live without excuses, uh, without wishful thinking, um, without unearned guilt, without unchosen obligations, and without the need for validation by others. It's also a tremendously uh, empowering way to live, which you'll find among the ranks of many of Ayn Rand's admirers and so many modern Dagny Taggart's, Howard Rourke's, and John Galt's. Just look at the lineup of uh, last week's record-breaking in-person Atlas Society Gala uh, hosted here in Malibu last week. That includes our honoree, Peter Diamandis, founder of XPRIZE, pioneer of commercial space flight. That includes uh, Lululemon founder, Chip Wilson, who presented Peter Diamandis with the Lifetime Achievement Award. That includes volleyball star, Gabby Reese, big wave surfer, Laird Hamilton, and Spartan race founder, uh, Joe DeSena, who all participated in our athlete, athlete as Atlas panel. Um, and it also includes uh, a rock legend who credited Ayn Rand for helping to inspire his creative vision, but who unfortunately passed away earlier um, this year. And that was of course the drummer and songwriter, Neil Pert of the band Rush. So I'll, I'll close with a few lines from Rush's anthem, which was of course inspired by Ayn Rand's novella of the same name. Live for yourself. There's no one else more worth living for. Begging hands and bleeding hearts will only cry out for more. Know your place in life is where you want to be. Don't let them tell you that you owe it all to me. Keep on looking forward. No use in looking around. Hold your head high above the crowd and they won't bring you down. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to questions. Well, thank you. Um, it seems like you have a very, or you have a pretty comprehensive view um, in the world that you're pretty confident about. Um, could you share the last time you changed your mind about an important issue? Ah, uh, wow. Pretty, pretty recently. Um, I think that I had one, one important issue that um, I felt that, um, you know, I, I don't think I was taking uh, coronavirus as seriously as um, I, as, as in, in reality, it needed to be taken seriously, uh, in part because of um, I'm not in a very vulnerable population. And because it's kind of a libertarian, I really don't like being told what to do. Um, I also have a deep uh, mistrust of the agenda of a lot of politicians um, and, uh, and a mistrust of, um, of the news media. But, um, but I came around to see that in hosting our gala last week, that we had um, a a variety of people. We had dozens of students, but we also had donors there as old, uh, you know, in their 90s. Uh, we had uh, my parents, you know, who were 80. And, um, and I realized that actually we could, we could do something and we could, um, we could, we could find a way to get everybody tested 
um, rapidly with rapid antigen tests, and uh, and we could find the perfect mask, you know, that is designed for athletic performance. Uh, that we could do it, that we could hold it outside, that we could figure it out, that we could do it. So that was a big, um, just, I mean, the most kind of recent uh, changing of my mind on an important issue. Um, but much earlier on, like I, when I, I know I, I like to, like I said, I do like to have fun. I think fun is, is probably in more need than philosophy these days, but, uh, and that I do believe that philosophy can be fun, right? That it doesn't have to be so uh, serious and, and, and you know, um, intimidating. So that's really kind of part of our MO at the Atlas Society. But, um, but I was, you know, had a few uh, things in my speech that obviously were not true, but it is true that I voted for uh, Dukakis. And it is true that I uh, grew up in a very liberal Democrat household and um, that I changed my mind. And I changed, you know, I changed how I came to view uh, politics. But I'm really grateful that I had that, um, that upbringing and that I am the only, you know, non liberal Democrat in my family because I think that it's helped me to have an appreciation uh, for people that don't share my point of view and, um, and a toleration. And that is just so important, not just in terms of talking with people from different political parties, but even just talking within, you know, the ranks of objectivists. And that is why uh, open objectivism and why the Atlas Society exists because uh, we felt at our founding and I'm afraid that I still believe that to be the case now that, uh, that in a movement around a philosophy that's supposed to be based on um, individualism, independent thinking and uh, ob objectivity that, uh, that there is too much intolerance um, even within the ranks of, of objectivists. So. So those, those are just a few, um, but boy, I mean, you know, the thing is I've made so many mistakes in my life, tons and tons of mistakes. And I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with making mistakes. Um, I wouldn't say I like making mistakes because mistakes have consequences, but I like the consequences of the consequences of making a mistake, which is that I learned something and I'm also able to model for others that it is okay, you know, to not, not be perfect. Um, it is okay to fall flat on your face. So hope that answers your question. I wanted to go back to your discussion about India and collectivism. You mentioned that a lot of the students you were speaking to were talking about the dramatic failures of collectivism. And I think when I think about Indian culture, I think collectivism is more rooted in the culture and then can possibly transcend into the economy. So do you think that um, the failure that's happening in India in your eyes is a failure of Indian culture's focus on collectivism or the Indian economy's focus on collectivism? Oh, that is such a great question. Uh, and I like to say, that um, politics is downstream from culture and culture is downstream from philosophy. And as Ayn Rand talked about, uh, religion is a, um, a, a kind of a primitive form of philosophy. It is a way of trying to talk about, you know, how, who am I? Why am I here? Uh, how do I know? How should I treat other people? Um, I have to say I am a little, bit biased because I am such a, uh, a, a, a like a original cultural appropriator, um, grew up in a house uh, surrounded by Indian art and um, just love so much about Indian culture, but I'm not a part of it, right? So I can't, I would really almost more uh, defer to you um, but uh, I mean, yes, there are aspects of, of Indian culture that I think that are more, you know, collectivistic, including it's not just like a nationalism of we are India. It's just the in incredible diversity uh, within India from different regions and different sects. Um, but uh, I, I also think that, I mean, there is also no denying that there are aspects of Indian culture that are extremely positive. I mean, you know, my father is a, a cardiologist. I mean, you know, it's a, he, he was a professor 
uh, of medicine at Harvard and, and then was um, uh, head of cardiology at University of California, San Francisco. And I mean, he always remarks that by far, you know, some of the, the brightest, most ambitious, smartest students that um, he has mentored and that the doctors that he's seen that they came, you know, from India. So that was, I, maybe it was, it was part that they were like, I need to, I want to leave, you know, they wanted to, to get out of there. They wanted to come to the United States, but I, I would tend to think that it, there are also probably some very positive aspects of the culture. Um, so you said that the democratic presidential primary was a contest um, for who could offer the most free stuff. Why do you think that the candidate who was promising the least free stuff won that contest? Um, I, I think in part um, that uh, it's the same thing that I was mentioning that Nancy Pelosi, you know, said uh, that she kind of is concerned that um, the that the party is being pushed so far in, in one direction that she she wants she's she's worried you know she's she's not just worried about what's happening next year she's she's worried what's happening you know two years down the road, five years down the road. Uh, and, you know, I can say that my parents uh, who are liberal Democrats probably feel the same way, at least my father, who I think is a little bit more moderate than, than my mother. You know, my mother was all in for uh, Bernie Sanders, um, but my father was like looking at this and saying, I don't think this ends well for the general coalition that, you know, he, he uh, feels is, is, is a better choice. So, um, but you know, I, th I think there are people who also feel that, um, that Bernie Sanders was p possibly not given um, the, the, you know, a fair shake that the, the party, uh, the establishment of the Democratic Party uh, was more committed to uh, seeing um, their establishment candidate. And there's no, what, you know, who could be more of an establishment candidate than someone who has been in uh, office for 47 years. So, um, you know, I, I do think that that is in a way sort of strangely what you're seeing playing out right now. And it is, whoa, I mean, you know, this is like death match. Uh, you're kind of seeing establishment versus anti-establishment. Could have been something, it could have been a different way. I mean, if it had been Bernie Sanders and it had been somebody other than Trump, it would have been establishment, you know, versus non-establishment. But the, you know, the the size of, of government uh, and the amount of money that is at stake has grown so um, much exponentially uh, in, in the past, um, you know, 70, 80, uh, years that there is there is a lot at, at stake, and so I think a lot of um, uh, what is sometimes called uh, deep state or um, you know establishment there's there's interests in, in not having those um, those arrangements uh, disrupted. So the next question is from a student. Um, they're asking with increased polarization, even the mere mention of Rand or her works causes people to put up a barrier to further discussion. How do you get around this? Well, that's a great question. So if you look at a lot of the uh, work that we have at the Atlas Society, and I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna go to the, the premise of, of what she said, because so I have been an Ayn Rand fan uh, for many, many years. I have an Ayn Rand license plate on my Jagni Tesla transcontinental. Um, and I found even like with having that license plate that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people would get really, you know, angry and very, very mad and just uh, have terrible things to say. But then when I, as, as time went on, and by the time that I was um, recruited to run the Outlet Society, which was uh, almost five years ago, I found that that had gone away. So that that had been replaced from like hostility, entrenched uh, cognitive priors that, you know, I, I'm, you're evil, whatever, that uh, had been uh, 
replaced by the blank stare. So I was like, wow, this is, it. if awareness of Ayn Rand, you know, sort of if the, the anti Ayn Rand crowd had been successful, and by the way, the pro Ayn Rand crowd that just had such a terrible approach to promoting and spreading the ideas, okay, that they probably did more than the anti Ayn Rand crowd to, uh, to make the whole entire thing um, irrelevant. Um, but if whatever combination of forces, the, the, the end result has been that Ayn Rand is, uh, is, is less recognized and I'm getting blank stares. And to me, that was like, this is a tremendous opportunity to reintroduce Ayn Rand on my terms, you know, on, on, the, way, on the way that it, what it means to me to talk about her as uh, a, a woman who fled, you know, a totalitarian state, never saw her family again, as an immigrant to the United States, who didn't, you know, hardly spoke English, uh, who had nothing, and who built up a successful career. Um, and then also to really take a step back and, you know, we are not an Ayn Rand museum, okay? We are not an Ayn Rand mausoleum. We are the Atlas Society. We are committed to these principles. We don't conflate, you know, person and Ayn Rand. And I, I see this so clearly. So when uh, along the lines of like introducing her to, um, to, to people, to new generation in, in new fun ways, I had noticed that there was a lot of popularity with living history that people would do and, and popularity with impersonations in general that people just love impersonations. So I started doing, um, well, I first did, my name is Ayn Rand, Draw My Life. And I worked with a professional Hollywood coach to work on my Russian accent. Um, and I did the whole voiceover. And then I was like, well, why not keep going? You know, why not just go full Chautauqua, put on a wig and do an Ayn Rand impersonation? And I did. Um, and the kids loved it. But there are there's a certain cadre of people that treat Ayn Rand as if, it's, it's, as if she's a religious figure. So for them, I have never seen such a violent reaction. It would be, I, I guess, how some, uh, you know, people would react if they were to see uh, Muhammad, you know, like drawn or impersonated or whatever. It was just really something extreme. So um, but on a practical level, uh, I would say, you know, if you look at our content, if you look at our memes, if you look at our Draw My Life, some of them incorporate Ayn Rand, but a lot of them don't. So um, yeah, the, the last video that we did, My Name is Venezuela, no mention of Ayn Rand. Uh, the Draw My Life that we did, My Name is Frederick Douglass, no mention of Ayn Rand. Um, I'm doing uh, two videos next week um, on uh, my name is free speech. My name is um, property rights. Um, very little mention of Ayn Rand. So the, you know, there's just a lot of ways to uh, to talk about it. You can talk about the values. You just have to kind of know who you're talking to. But you know, just the most important thing that you could do is just smile. You know, and just say, oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, so you, uh, you, you know, it doesn't work for you. I, I can't tell you how much benefit I've gotten out of it. Don't be shocked. You know, I mean, it's just you model how to be, and you just you just smile and you just say, "Oh, wow, that's you know, funny. I really liked it." And move on to the next. So we have a question from a parent um, who asks, "How does Ayn Rand's philosophy address issues with public goods such as clean air, health, and climate?" Um, yeah, well, one thing that I think is worth mentioning is that uh, in countries where there is the most prosperity uh, and uh, the most uh, freest markets, um, those tend to be countries with cleaner air and cleaner water. Uh, and countries that are more socialist, such as uh, North Korea, um, or uh, China in certain of its developing communist um, uh, phases and uh, USSR, um, that th those are associated with actually the worst environmental outcomes. Um, so, uh, you know, Ayn Rand was not an anarchist. She uh, believed in uh, the right of um, uh, th that government had three functions. One, to uh, defend against foreign invasion, uh, which was the military. One was the police to defend against aggressors and, and crime. And three, what uh, are the courts to, uh, to adjudicate um, 
differences uh, punish criminals and adjudicate uh, contracts. So, um, you know, in a, um, a free society, uh, you're not allowed to take the property of others and polluting a stream where there are people that are living um, in a city down uh, two cities away that you're actually um, expropriating uh, something from, from them. But generally, um, I think that she would say that uh, when property is private, uh, it tends to be a lot better treated, a lot better cared for. Uh, we don't throw trash into our own backyard. Uh, we don't um, create fires in our, in our own home. Um, so uh, the, the less that we have in the public domain, the more likely it is that people are going to be better stewards of their land and of, uh, of the property. Ayn Rand um, prized property, property rights above almost anything else, and it seems like you do as well. Uh, she also once said that before the arrival of European colonizers, Native Americans lived like animals or cavemen, so any European who brought with him an element of civilization had the right to take over this continent, and it's, that, it's great that some of them did. Why didn't Native Americans deserve property rights too, and do they for you? Um, yes, they do, and I'm, you know, aware of that uh, that quote by her. Uh, it was not a part of a prepared speech. I believe it was sort of a off the cuff um, response, and it was in her usual full throated Russian passionate uh, and sometimes quite judgmental and negative way. But I think it should be. Uh, rejected. I mean, proper, as you, you said, property is fundamental uh, in, in objectivism. In Ayn Rand's philosophy, she talked about it really as the right from which all other rights um, flow. Uh, and to, to the extent that um, there is someone who has created property by mixing in their labor and their investment, and then it becomes private property. But, you know, it, you can also go, you can continue to go back far, right? So the Native American Indians, they came from other lands as well, and they conquered other, you know, uh, tribes as well. So um, at, at, at some point, I do think that Ayn Rand was making a point, which is that enlightenment values are superior to, uh, to tribalistic values. And uh, that a, uh, a respect for for law um, and uh, a market economy uh, and science that these are our values um, and that they are uh, that they are values that is it, it's important that they are instituted in society. But um, but I, I do think that that was uh, less. Um, less central to some of her more well thought out and well defended positions. I mean, she's said a lot of other things that I don't agree with as well. And that's one of the reasons that we don't conflate uh, philosophy with an individual and their foibles, their mistakes, and uh, possibly some of their erroneous and somewhat, you know, time context bound articulated views. Yeah, so going off of Nandini's question, um, just like to kind of get your thoughts or what you, how you would interpret either objectivism or the objectivist view or Ayn Rand's view on the idea of reparations. It's hard to deny that the wealthy United States um, is built upon that institution, the institution of slavery. Um, so what would Ayn Rand say about kind of reparations to descendants of African-American slaves? And yeah, how well, would first your of all, differ? yeah, I would, I would roundly reject the idea that the wealth of the United States was built on the back of slavery. I, I think that is, uh, slavery was a part of the agrarian South. It was not an economically uh, viable or productive system. Uh, it was the North which em embraced um, more uh, industrialization and, and the use of technology and the use of machines uh, to modernize and to be productive as opposed to 
uh, using other people as, as slave chattel. Um, so it was that was what the, the wealth of the United States was was built on and not on the uh, the institution of slavery. Um, I, I think that I'm completely against um, the idea of, of reparations. Uh, I think that that would be then treating people that are here in the United States uh, that, um, you know, they don't own slaves. They came from Europe or they came from India or they came from, you know, Kenya or whatever. And now they are going to be responsible for um, being slaves. I mean, having themselves treated as property, having their lives, their work treated as property. I just think uh, it's, it's a very negative uh, way to think. And I think um, if, if to the extent that there is a stain, uh, in, in a historic stain in terms of that uh, slavery was, was part of uh, um, the beginnings of, of the United States, uh, there's a much better way to address it. And that is by um, creating more economic opportunity, more jobs, more businesses, and to um, promoting a philosophy and a message that completely squarely rejects uh, victimhood as a, uh, a foundation and rejects this whole postmodern um, project, postmodernist project of trying to salvage uh, after Marx, Marxist policies and Mar Marxist uh, economics have been such a complete and disastrous failure to try to salvage that aspect of Marxism, which was like the oppressors and the oppressed, uh, the, you know, the grievance culture, and then trying to apply that to differences in gender, differences in ethnicity, differences in sexual, you know, orientation. I mean, that, that is just a very, very destructive um, orientation and it's so bad for you guys. It's so bad for you guys. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not the path for all of the young people uh, listening, uh, you know, to, to be successful and to accomplish what you want in life. You have to let go of uh, grievance culture. Why should we have billionaires? What do you mean we, pale face? <laughs> you remember that from uh, the Lone Ranger? Okay, well, so, but what do you mean we? Who do you mean we? Society, American society. Okay, so, but what do you mean by society? Like, why should we have billionaires in America? So I guess that, that's, that's one of the, you know, as I was mentioning in my speech that we talk about uh, premises, right? And you start with first principles. So um, when we, now I will define we, okay? So we as those of us in this webinar, right? Or those of us in a school or those of us in a class or those of us in uh, participating in a political season at school, when we use the word we, a lot of times what people are talking about is me. So, um, so I, I, I guess I just kind of go back when you say like we, that means as a country, let, let's just say as a country, just for the sake of argument, we'll say as the United States, should the United States have billionaires? Okay. Um, well, uh, if you mean by someone who has found ways to solve the needs of billions of people then I think we need more of those people. I think, I think that would be really excellent if we had a lot more billionaires and we, we can and we will have a lot more billionaires if we, uh, if we had reject thinking like why should we have billionaires? Um, because uh, in a free market or, or mostly free market system, you don't get to be a billionaire by uh, getting a government contract to uh, take over and uh, mine, you know, the, the nation's resources. Um, you, you get it by creating a Google, you get it by creating a Facebook. I mean, those jokes that I had at the top of our, uh, of, of my remarks were about people who dropped out of Harvard uh, to, to create products that solved people's needs for more efficient ways of communicating, of, um, of doing research, of doing, you know, schoolwork. I mean, I remember when I worked at the White House, 
uh, the way that you researched a speech was you went to a library, you took out these books, you read all of the books, you wrote it down. And um, now we have, we have internet search, you know, so uh, whoever created those things came up, you know, with great ideas, met the needs of billions of people and made billions of dollars. And by the way, what do you think they do with the, the billion dollars once they make them? You know, they, they just burn it, you know, they just kind of throw it around, you know, they, 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 that's what, that's what capitalism is. Okay. So that's why, one of the reasons why I, when people say, oh, you shouldn't say capitalism, you should just talk about free market. I'm like, no, I'm going to talk about capitalism because it's capital investment, you know, that from accumulated capital that people have made by being successful entrepreneurs uh, that then goes into the next round of businesses. I was just on a call yesterday with um, two young women who uh, were PhD um, scientists out of Brazil. They came to the United States, thank goodness, I, and they're, they're, they're gonna become billionaires, but one of the, they've got these revolutionary products to stop uh, skin cell senescence, which is going to help with a whole bunch of things like skin cancer and, and aging. And, um, you know, they were able to start the company because billionaires invested in it, you know? So uh, I, that is a, a far better system, I think, than, uh, than just being focused on, um, on just eco income inequality because all of those inventions that the billionaires have uh, launched, those are the things that are really improving the lives of, of people that are uh, at the bottom of the economic uh, ladder, cell phones, air conditioning, refrigerator, washing machine, you know, water fi filtration. I mean, th th those are things that benefit people that, uh, that are now enjoying a standard of living that uh, wasn't available to the billionaires of, uh, of, of, of monarchies of, of the ages past. So, um, so yeah. Great, um, before I conclude, do you have any parting thoughts for us? Uh, no, I'm just so um, honored to, to be here and uh, to see so many students from around the world. And um, uh, really would love to invite you guys uh, perhaps to take a next step to look into the resources of the Atlas Society. We have a lot of um, opportunities for students to get together to learn more. We've got a book club uh, that reads books by people like Peter Diamandis and, and other innovators and entrepreneurs. Uh, we've got our Atlas advocates. Uh, we've got our Atlas intellectuals and um, lots of uh, webinars every, every week. We'd love to get you involved. Please uh, reach out to us via the Atlas Society website or on our Facebook and uh, let us know if you'd like to get involved. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. A special thanks to Jennifer Grossman and to all of those who sent in questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual app event, which will be next Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Professor Lily Geisman will be addressing the Democratic Party's relationship with suburban voters. Thank you all and have a great evening. Bye.